Welcome to the Femininja Project. I am your host, Cheryl I Love, middle-aged ninja hiding in plain sight, dedicated to restoring human dignity one person at a time and helping you unleash your personal power. Discover that it's possible to look like a woman, act like a lady, move like a ninja, and think like a warrior. And remember, men are always welcome on the Femininja Project. Welcome to another episode of the Feminine Ninja Project, and thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. And as you know by now, on the show, we are all about personal empowerment, overcoming obstacles, and finding your purpose in life. And today's guest is an amazing young woman. Her name is Sarah Manuel. She is an entrepreneur, a life purpose coach, where she helps women envision their dreams so they can achieve them and live a life of purpose and joy. Sarah has never taken no for an answer. I think she's a woman after my own heart. Despite being in a wheelchair and given a death sentence as a child, Sarah never accepted her limitations. When she was told to be satisfied, to merely exist, She told anyone who would listen her dreams for the future, including having a meaningful career, falling in love, and having a child. Sarah successfully turned these dreams into reality. She's going to share her story with us and tell you how you can change your dreams into reality as well. Sarah, thank you so much for being here and welcome to the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. It is an honor to have you reading your story and going through some of your history. I mean, it just really warmed my heart to know how much you were able to accomplish and still accomplishing. And all of those naysayers that were telling you what you could not do, you kind of ignored them and you figured out for yourself what you could do. So just share your story with us. So yeah, you kind of uh, mentioned it it starts with my birth, really. And I was born with a genetic disability called spinal muscular atrophy, which Mm -hmm. is one of the muscular dystrophy diseases. So along with um, that diagnosis comes a lot of weakness. So to give you an idea, um, like one pound of weight is really heavy for me. So Mm -hmm. I am extremely weak. I've never been able to walk except in water when I was younger, because I, I, water makes you weightless. So I was able to walk. So that was cool. But um, I've never been able to walk and I've always lived my life in a wheelchair. So I've always come from the perspective of, well, I, there's things in life I want to do. So I need to figure out how I'm going to do it and not just sit on the sidelines and watch everyone else live their life. So yeah, it, it kind of just started with that kind of mentality. And I Grew up in a small town where, um, like, it like there were thirty five kids in my class. The town had less than a thousand people, so wow. for anything to happen at school, everyone had to participate. So I just found different ways to participate in some of the things. When you started sharing some of your dreams and your hopes for the future with other people, what was their reaction? I'm just really curious. Did they try and discourage you from having those dreams or did they listen? Did they encourage you? How did they respond? Well, I kind of got a mix of responses when it came to like going to college and that kind of thing. The people that knew me knew I was smart and that I could handle that. So that wasn't a surprise to them and that was something that they discouraged. Mm-hmm. Um, but when it came to some of the more personal things like getting married and having a child and that was kind of like, okay, now you're now you're pushing it. Mm-hmm. So it, it was, I didn't really share those dreams with a lot of people because I didn't want the negativity. Mm-hmm. Well, I can totally understand that. There's nothing worse than somebody taking away your hope or shattering your dreams. Right. And I knew, like, I had this inner knowledge that I may not have a lot of, like, boyfriend relationships, but I would, I would find the one I needed to find and get married. Like, I just, I knew that into the core of my being. 
and I found my husband almost, well, almost 22 years ago, we'll be um, celebrating 20 years of marriage in July. Oh my God, that's great. Congratulations. That's wonderful. So I'm really curious, when did you decide that, um, how old were you when you decided that, yes, you were going to be able to find a, a husband, get married and have a family? What, was that really early in, in life or did that come a little bit later? Um, I think that knowledge kind of came in college. Mm -hmm. Like I, I just kind of had this sense of peace come over me one day. Like I don't need to worry about finding someone. I didn't need to really think about how it was going to happen. I just, I knew it was, it would happen. So tell us, how did you meet your husband? We met in 1999. So it, it was a while ago. We met in a chat room. Oh. And that was back when you only heard about like axe murders coming out of chat rooms. Oh. So my parents were terrified and it's like, no, I, I think he's nice. It's, I think it's going to be okay. But, and it was like a whirlwind romance and it happened pretty quickly. We were together two years before we got married, but um, like the whole connection, because when you build your connection through just talking, Mm -hmm. Um, I think it grows faster, especially because we were both, we were both looking for something more. So it's not like we had to drag the other one. Mm -hmm. So yeah. And it was just, it was, we knew. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. And then when you, I mean, did you have any problems conceiving? I mean, if this gets too personal, you don't have to answer, but as far as, you know, getting pregnant, what because of your I don't I don't want to say the word disability because I, I that's not in my um, vocabulary anyhow um, let's just say but because and of your I challenges really, I don't like the word disability because you're starting um you're describing me first by the things I can't do rather than the things I can do mm -hmm. and to me I can do a whole heck of a lot more than what I can't do so that's why I'm not a big fan of the word, but I use it because people know what it means. Mm -hmm. And so then um, going back to having your, your, your son is. Yes. I have so, so going back then, did you have any trouble conceiving and, you know, giving birth? I would imagine that with all the muscular um, weaknesses that you have to deal with, that that might've been a little bit of a challenge. Yeah, our biggest hurdle was having like all the doctors um, give us the same message. Cause some doctors would tell us, yeah, you could do it. Other doctors would say, oh no, you'll die if you, if oh. you try to do this. So um, we finally just made a decision that our lives would be better off for trying, knowing, you know, whatever would happen, we would, we were willing to take the risk. Mm -hmm. And so when we decided to get pregnant, I got pregnant immediately. I had a really easy pregnancy. My, they were really concerned about my lungs mm -hmm. and they actually got stronger through the pregnancy rather than the reverse. I carried him full term. I was a day short of 38 weeks and wow. we had a plan C-section. So it, it was amazing. And again, I had this sense of peace that we were both going to be just fine. Mm -hmm. So the people around me were freaking out, but I knew well, that we were going to be okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's kind of like their job. That's what they're supposed to do. Yeah. I find that so right. fascinating about your lung function and your lungs actually getting stronger when you were pregnant. Um, I'm yeah. a former respiratory therapist. That was my first um, career that I did for mm -hmm. 17 years before coming, becoming a physical therapist. And so that's, I find that so intriguing because a lot of times pregnancy actually limits your lung capacity because, you know, it impedes the diaphragm. So I'm just wondering what it was, if it was maybe just the hormones or whatever that was going through you, that were going through you, that was actually making them stronger. Or maybe it was just that sensation of absolute joy in the fact that you were having a baby. Yeah, like even because um, because my muscles are weak, it's also hard for them to draw blood from me or to put an IV in or anything. Mm -hmm. That wasn't a problem when I was pregnant either. So I don't know if it was part mindset, if it was just I had this 
superpower running through me when I was pregnant? Um, I don't know, but um, what I loved, my, I loved being pregnant. And mm -hmm. it was like the one and only time that I was completely capable of taking care of him all on my own. Aww. Like my body was complete because I needed help to do the rest of this, you know, when he was born to change his diapers and give him a bath and do all that. Mm -hmm. um, I was able to do more than we thought I would be able to do, but like just with getting him dressed and stuff, that was stuff I needed help with. But when he was, when he was inside me, I was able to take care of all of his needs on my own. And so that was just a special time for me. And you could actually even protect him at the same time too. Yes. Yeah. So one of the things that you said that really got my attention was that you didn't know if it was mindset or that you got these superpowers. I'm thinking that maybe it was your mindset that gave you superpowers. <laughs> yeah, I could totally go for that. <laughs> because you are really big on having a positive mindset, obviously, just by hearing your story and then looking at you. I mean, you just vibrate with vitality and energy and positive vibes. It's You can just see it in your face and in your body language. Oh, thank you. I realize looking back now that I've always had this knack for reframing things mm -hmm. before I even knew what reframing was. Mm -hmm. So I would take something that other people would consider negative and I would just try to find the positive side of things. So I've always just been able to do, I think that's been a survival skill of mine. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to bring up a few key points that um, I, I got from our communication prior to the recording. You say that your circumstances don't have to dictate your reality. Yeah, well... I, I'm not supposed to be here. I, the doctors told my parents, I wouldn't live past the age of four or five. So <gasps> to, you know, have 40 years on top of that, um, birthdays are definitely something I celebrate and I announce how old I am. And because I, I wasn't supposed to have all of these birthdays, I wasn't supposed to be here. So I think I could have taken that and it was never really spoken to me but there's just kind of this knowledge at some point that there are some serious issues with me mm -hmm. so I just kind of maybe took that and just said okay well this is what you think I can do I'm going to show you what I can do mm -hmm. and whenever somebody would tell me no it's like oh, I'm going to prove you wrong mm -hmm. so, and that has just it serves me very well you certainly have what I call the warrior spirit. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> You're a fighter. Yeah, I, I, I've had to be, um, mm -hmm. but now I'm getting to choose what battles to take on. Mm. So that's, that's really been, it's been fun for me to kind of be able to, to be in a place in my life when I can kind of pick and choose. And I'm mm -hmm. not necessarily fighting for my life now because I'm pretty stable with my condition. But yeah. Do you amaze the doctors? Do they look at you and just go, oh my gosh, you know, you're a phenom or, or what do they say? Like knowing the, what your prognosis had been. Right. They, um, they are definitely surprised with how much I'm able to do still because I am um, on some Facebook groups with other people people with my disability at my age and, and that sort of thing. And they have, you know, different tubes connected to them to help them breathe, to help them eat, you know, that kind of thing. And I don't have anything like that. So I can just see that and say, oh my gosh, I had no idea how, how much strength, how, how good I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So the doctors kind of like, when we ask them, they're like, yeah, you're, you're definitely doing well. We're kind of surprised. Yeah, you're doing great. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's kind of reinforcing to think, okay, I don't need to panic. I just need to relax. I'm doing, I'm doing just fine. Yeah. You are doing incredibly well. It's just amazing. And another thing that you said, um, you're, you talk about rejecting society's rules and expectations about living life in a wheelchair. Yes. Is that hard to do? Oh yeah, it's definitely hard to do. Um, 
there was there's an expectation um and many people probably don't even realize they have it but when you see someone with a physical disability you kind of assume a cognitive disability also mm. so i know that when i was in college i would make a point to go see my professors the first week of class so they could meet me in person so they would know that i'm there because i earned my spot that i am capable of the intellectual fortitude that the class is going to take that i was capable of producing the work mm -hmm. um, so i have to go at least my perspective of it is i have to go above and beyond to prove that end of myself mm -hmm. so that they don't underestimate me or they don't think less of me what did you get your um degree in i got two bachelor degrees in interior design and journalism I went to law school for a semester and a half before I decided I wanted a life instead of being a lawyer. And then um, after a few years, after I kind of got a vision for my life and what I wanted to do, I um, went to get my master's in school psychology and that's what I've been doing for the past 13 years. Oh my goodness, wow. Like I said, you're just unstoppable. You're, you're <laughs> my kind of woman, I just absolutely love it. So well, it's interesting because that transformation came because I used to be in total denial of my disability. Like I would call to make a reservation somewhere and not ask if it was wheelchair accessible. Uh, and then like my parents would say, well, is it accessible? I'm like, I don't know. So I'd have to call back. And so, cause I just, I wasn't in that mindset of, that I was different. I didn't want to be different. I wanted to be like everyone else. Mm -hmm. So much so that I didn't even like to be around other people with disabilities, no matter what their disability was, because it reminded me of my own. Because in my small little town, I was the only one. So I could kind of pretend that I wasn't different. Mm -hmm. But when I was face to face with somebody else with a disability, it was like a mirror. I couldn't I couldn't ignore it. I had to acknowledge it. And it, it was very uncomfortable. So when I finally recognized, accepted and embraced my difference of being in a wheelchair, I went from like, that's when I found my purpose. Mm -hmm. I went from, you know, just totally rejecting that side of myself to doing a complete 180. And now I identify and advocate for kids with disabilities and their families. Oh, so I made this huge transformation that um, wouldn't have been possible if I kept denying who I was. And I and when I realized that I was made different for a reason and that I wasn't a mistake, mm -hmm. that's when it all fell into place for me. So when you say that you work with um, children and parents, of, uh, you know, who, with disabilities. Is that something that you did professionally or do you still do it professionally? Yeah, that's um, the work I do as a school psychologist and I, I continue oh. to do that. So basically what a school psychologist does is I assess kids to see if they qualify for special education, mm -hmm. which means when, when you do say that they qualify, you're saying that they have a disability. Mm -hmm. So... And are these all physical disabilities that you're dealing with or a range of a spectrum? Yeah, there are 13 qualifying categories dealing everything from learning disabilities to autism, to intellectual disabilities, to physical disabilities, the whole range. So you also have something on the side then because you're working full time, it sounds like. Yes. And you're a full time mom. Yes. And you also put together a course called Destination Tomorrow. Right. Tell us about that. So when I looked back on how I kind of got onto my path, when I found my purpose. Mm -hmm. So for me, I didn't know how I was going to achieve it. And I wasn't even sure what it looked like until I started to do some of these exercises that helped me envision it. And I think if you can't envision where you're going, you don't know how to get there. You kind of need a roadmap or a GPS. And that's what, that's what gave me the guidance. So I put together a class called Destination Tomorrow. 
that teaches a series of exercises to help visualize your future, um, to help you find your life of purpose and meaning so that you can live a life of joy. Mm -hmm. So this is an online course that you offer. Do you work with people one-on-one as well as a coach? I haven't done that yet, but I would be open to that. But at this point, it's just an online course. There was also something else that I got from your profile, something that you said is that our differences are not mistakes. Yes, that was a huge piece of the puzzle for me because to me, I I think I had to realize that I was made for a reason. I was in a wheelchair for a reason. And instead of rejecting that, to embrace it and to kind of try to figure out what that reason was. And that that was by no means a mistake that I was put in a wheelchair. There is Mm -hmm. a definite reason, a definite purpose for me experiencing life on these wheels. So when I was able to realize that, I was, you know, the whole world opened up to me. And about at what point in your life did that happen? It was after I got my bachelor's degrees, after I tried to, you know, go out in the world and try to kind of go up the corporate ladder and that wasn't really working out for me. And I was just like, and I was, I actually was working a 40 plus hour week as a customer service representative for a health insurance company. Wow. So I was typing the whole time and my body with my disease could not keep up. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, well now what? I hated that job, but it was a job. So now what? Mm -hmm. And with the visualization that I did, and I was just able to kind of put the pieces together that, you know, school psychology was a path that I needed to pursue. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that you brought up visualization because that is such a powerful tool in kind of getting rid of a lot of the noise. Mm-hmm. And being able to find your, your purpose and find some direction to know exactly how to get to where you're going rather than, you know, all the doubts and all the self-talk and everything. But if you can see yourself um, where you want to be, then it will happen. Absolutely. And it's not going to be an overnight process, but if you're patient with yourself and you just, I think you sometimes know if you're on the right path or not, you may need a little tweak here or there, but. I think you can kind of tell if you're on the right path. So you are working on that second course. Yes. How do you find the time to get everything done? I don't even know. I, when the pandemic happened last year, I decided, you know what? I've been thinking about this for all these years. I tried it like five years ago. It wasn't going anywhere. So I kind of quit. And it just got to a point where... I couldn't not do it anymore. I have to, I have to do this. Like I know I'm supposed to be doing this. Mm-hmm. So I just kind of sh- shuffle things to where I have time. Mm-hmm. I make time because it, it's a priority for me. I really want to ask about your family because, you know, your parents have got to be so proud of you. Yeah. And, you know, just your, your life is basically this incredible gift especially considering what they told, you know, they were told when you were born, it's just must be amazing for them just to see where you're at right now. Yeah. And I wonder if it's almost too good to believe at some point that we thought we were going to lose you. And now, you know, we're watching you flourish. So it's pretty, it's pretty cool. And they have a grandchild. Yes, they do. (laughs) (laughs) Now, do you have any siblings? I have two older brothers. From what I understand with the category of muscular dystrophy, that Mm -hmm. it it does run in families or is is yours just a rare, rare case or a rare form? Oh, no. Um, So both my parents were carriers and there was a one in four chance, you know, their kids would have it. So my brothers got lucky or, and um, I was the one that that ended up having it because my parents wanted more than three kids. Mm. So as soon as they got my diagnosis, they're like, okay, well, I guess we're done having kids. And I know it, it's also genetic. So um, when my niece went to um, plan for her having a child, 
she tested positive for the gene also. So her husband had to get tested and he was negative. So one in 40 people carry the gene. Wow. That's really actually a lot. Yeah. And it's actually the number one genetic killer of kids under two. Oh my. So it, it's a deadly disease, but they have so many amazing treatments now. Um, just within the past few years, it had been developed, whereas before there was nothing. Wow. That's incredible. So now how's your son? He's fine. He, when I was pregnant, we tested him um, when I, in utero and he didn't have it. So we were just able to breathe a huge sigh of relief. And also he tends to be very stubborn. So when he was a baby, he didn't crawl until he was ready on his time. Mm. He didn't walk until he was ready on his time. So it was good to know that it's not due to, to the disability, to the, to the muscular dystrophy. Mm-hmm. So that just by a whole sense of peace, knowing that he was negative, a carrier for it, but he doesn't have it. Okay. So is he a, car- a carrier or, or do, do you not know that yet? We're, we're pretty sure he is. Cause I mean, he got both of the genes from me. So I, we were told he's definitely a carrier, mm-hmm. but he's got to be very proud of you too. Yeah. He's a sweet boy. So he's always helping me out and and asking, you know, what he can do to to help me. And so he's, he's a sweetie. Well, congratulations. Uh, You know, you have such an amazing story. And I think it's such an inspiration for a lot of people who might be thinking, you know, having challenges. And it kind of puts some of our challenges into perspective when they see somebody like you who actually was given no chance at life, you know, from the very beginning and your parents were told, well, you know, she won't make it to the age of four and to see you now and thriving and doing all the things that you do. Do you sometimes even think that, how is this possible? Oh, absolutely. And I I know that like, even if I didn't have, the disability, it would still be amazing. All the things that I've accomplished. So you add that into it and it's like, oh, God is good. (laughs) Yes, indeed he is. And uh, he's certainly given you the tools to be able to take care of yourself and, and be strong and, and vibrant and healthy in spite of the things that you've been facing and challenged with. So I know that um, the course that you've created, it is more for women. Is that correct? Yeah, it's geared toward women, but men could get value out of it too, but it's more geared toward women. Mm -hmm. And uh, how can people find you, get a hold of you, or just learn a little bit more about Destination Tomorrow? Well, the website for Destination Tomorrow is sarahmanuel.com slash destination dash tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm on Instagram at Sarah Manuel 35 and at Facebook at Manuel Sarah 35. Do you have anything, any pearls of wisdom you would like to leave with the audience? Just to go back to differences aren't bad. They're just different. Mm-hmm. And you are made different for a reason. And instead of hiding those differences to fit in with society or the friend group or or wherever you are trying to fit in if you would just kind of let that go and embrace yourself for who you are and accept yourself for who you are there's no no limit to where you can go Mm -hmm. great words of wisdom (laughs) sarah this has been so wonderful i have just absolutely loved having you on the show thank you so much for being here thank you so much for having me And everybody, thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate you. And remember, our differences are not mistakes. And to really use the power of visualization to achieve your dreams. And don't let anybody tell you that you can't do what you know you can. So learn how to uh, not to take no for an answer, because I think it will obviously serve you well, because it did for Sarah. And that is the way of the Femininja. And that's a wrap on another episode of the Femininja Project. Thank you so much for listening. And remember, be safe, be strong. And until next time, bye now.